everyone, welcome back to another episode and I am so pumped for today's conversation. So let me just jump right into it because I wanna use every second of our time that we have together. So I am here today with Bill Eddy and he is what I call the godfather of a high conflict divorce. He's a legend in the divorce space and has dedicated his career to helping people disentangle from high conflict marriages. He was a certified family law specialist in California and a senior family mediator at the National Conflict Resolution Center in San Diego. Prior to becoming an attorney in 1992, he was a licensed clinical social worker with 12 years of experience providing therapy to children, adults, couples, and families. He has a really popular blog on Psychology Today website, which has over three and a half million views. And he is the author and co-author of 16 books on high conflict personalities. <laughs> Welcome, Bill. Thanks so much, Renee. I'm glad to be on. So I have, oh my gosh, I have so much to talk to you about and um, you know where to start is the challenge, but I think we'll start here. One of the questions that I see all of the time in my private Facebook group is about um, divorcing a high conflict spouse. And is it possible to divorce someone who is so high conflict without having to spend years in court and $100,000 in legal fees? It, I would say it really depends. And to control the part you can control, that the part that you can do to keep things calm, keep them focused, protect yourself, uh, have your information at hand. So when false allegations get made, when there's threats against you, all of that, that you have responses, you're ready, and also have a good team. It helps to have you know, a lawyer, at least that's on call for consultation, if not representation. It's good to have a therapist that's at, on mm -hmm. call, at least, if not regular. Um, and to have friends and family that understand what can, what can be supportive of you. So it's possible, but there's also parts beyond your control. And so it's being ready for all of that that's the key. Okay, so we hear the word narcissist a whole lot lately. And uh, do you think that that word is being overused? I think it's it's being a little overused, but not as much as a lot of people say, because often some of the most difficult situations do involve someone with narcissistic traits. Now, one thing to mention, there's a difference between traits and a disorder. So if someone really has the disorder, they're really dysfunctional, they're stuck in a pattern of arrogance, demeaning behavior, all of that. That's different from someone with traits who's self-absorbed and you know, kind of oblivious to the other person, but isn't necessarily trying to publicly humiliate and destroy the other person. That's where you get into the disorder. But there are a lot of uh, narcissists that people want to divorce um, because it's just intolerable to be that close to them. And so we do see a lot of that. It used to be kind of a joke in family lawyers. is like, yeah, yeah, the husband's a narcissist and the wife's a borderline. That's what everybody says. But now we're seeing that a lot. So it is a real problem. Is it possible to stay in a marriage and make it work with someone who has been diagnosed a narcissist? It's possible if you create a, a, a healthier life outside of that relationship. If you have friends, if you have interests, if you have things that give you self-esteem um, that are independent of that, what we find is I've seen people manage it okay, and it's usually because the narcissist is absorbed, say, in their work, and so their partner has a lot of time to focus on the kids, focus on friends, focus on other mm. things. So it's, it may be manageable, but realize you're not going to get that soothing, warmth, uh, self-esteem from the narcissist. You've got to get that somewhere. 
Mm, that's so interesting. So someone has to really make that decision on what they want in their life. Yes, and I've seen people do it and they say they're doing it for the kids. Like, mm. you know, the kids will graduate high school, the youngest will leave in two years, so I'm gonna hang in there two more years, something like that, I hear that a lot. Well, how do you feel about that? I, what I tell them is it really depends on your situation. If if you're gonna be totally wiped out and, and feel um, exhausted and bad about yourself two years from now, it may not be worth it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you found a way to manage this relationship, um, then for the sake of your kids having some stability may be helpful. But if, you're, if there's constant fighting and all of that, it's usually healthier for the kids that you live in separate households and that they're not exposed to all those daily fights. Right. So if someone is divorcing a high conflict spouse and everything that they do, the other person says the opposite of just because, what kind of techniques can that person use during the divorce and even post-divorce on co-parenting and how to really deal with someone like that? Well, a lot of it's developing a matter-of-fact approach and using some skills. One of the skills that we're teaching now is what we call ear statements where you give the person empathy, attention, or respect, uh, even a sentence or two to kind of calm them down, diffuse the conflict. Um, yeah, I appreciate um, the, the project you did last week, and I respect your relationship with our daughter, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things so that they calm the person. I talk about sprinkling your conversation with the word respect. Um, mm -hmm. That often helps with a narcissist. Uh, we also have a method for writing called BIF, mm -hmm. things that are brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And like a paragraph in response to a two-page diatribe. Um, so it's managing the relationship <clears throat> in a matter-of-fact way and not getting thrown off course because of what the other person says because that's about them, that's not about you. Yeah, so guys, for my listeners um, and people who are in my private Facebook group, you have heard me talk about Biff and like we're here today with the guy who came up with this, like he is, it's straight out of his mouth. So <laughs> it's, it's not me interpreting um, his words. So um, pay attention, this is really, really good stuff. So, um, let's talk about then, um, something that you have said is that you can catch other people's emotions. And I, I love that, that visual. So what does that mean? And how do we like deflect that catch? Yeah. So our brain is automatically designed to quickly absorb other people's emotions for group action. So think of like, I live near the ocean, so half a mile from the ocean. So if there's a gigantic tidal wave, I'm going to need to get out of here. So if I walk out the door someday and I see 30 people running towards the hill, I'm just going to start running. My brain's <laughs> going to say run before I even think consciously. So we catch emotions in a positive way like that. Well, we also can catch them negatively. So if someone's angry at you and they're, you know, three feet away, your brain's going to say, this is an emergency and you either need to get angry back mm -hmm. or get the heck out of here or hide. And so our brain wants to protect us. That's the amygdala in the brain. It says fight, flee, or freeze. Mm -hmm. And that... Also, we have mirror neurons in our brain. So we mirror other people's behavior to some extent. So a lot of this is automatic. You just start absorbing what's coming at you. But your prefrontal cortex, the, the part of your brain that's really conscious, you can think through, can, can manage all of this and tell your amygdala, hang on, it's okay, I got this. And so what you can do is actually turn around that negative emotion coming at you 
and send back a positive emotion, and that's these ear statements that I'm talking about. Either say something about empathy, or I'll pay attention, tell me more, or I respect you know, your efforts here, and I want to solve this problem. So it's kind of like judo or jujitsu, where you take the energy coming at you, spin it around, and send it back in a positive way, and then your emotions may be contagious and the other person often calms down. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I last fall, I had talked about um, starting a coffee challenge, a co-parent coffee challenge. And it's like show up at your kid's activity with a cup of coffee for your other, for, your, for the ex, because then they can't be a jerk to you. Like you hand them a <laughs> cup of coffee with the hope that it becomes like a contagious of like just being civil and a little respectful to the other person. And it goes Great a long idea. way. Great idea. So, but some people are just not going to accept that. And we have both seen them. We know that person who is so difficult that they don't care. They're going to, you know, swipe the coffee out of the, the other person's hand or continue to like hunker down and really um, just drive into their anger. And how, do, how does that other person handle that? Can they always just respond with respect and kindness? I think to me, too two ear statements is good. After that, if they're not having any impact, <clears throat> stop trying with those. Don't, don't exhaust yourself. Um, and either excuse yourself from the situation or focus on problem solving and say, we have a problem here, we need to decide choice A or choice B and focus on what to do. So not everybody's going to respond to an ear statement and not all the time. Mm -hmm. But they're worth a try, I think, at least twice. So if someone hands the cup of coffee, you say, yeah, I brought you a cup of coffee, and they knock it out of your hand, you say, oh, well, I guess it's not, not the day for that, is it? Um, and so one thing, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, to the extent you can is try to stay confident try to look confident and feel that what you're doing is reasonable. And if the other person doesn't like it or they're nasty back, is you can deal with that. Say, well, I guess we'll have to agree to disagree. And, and not look frustrated. Because when you look frustrated to a narcissist or other high conflict person, that's when they feel energized. They think, aha, now I'm in charge. So try to stay confident and don't engage too much. This is definitely some advice that I've had to use with other lawyers, co-counsel. <laughs> Those are techniques that become really important when you get a certain type that you're dealing with. Um, so this, is, this goes so much further than just an ex-spouse. Yes. So you have a book called five types of people who can ruin your life uh, we're not going to talk about all five types um, because i want people to buy your book but can you talk about two of those types yeah so let's let's say focus on first of all the narcissists and that the things i said already that they the ones with a disorder are invested in trying to humiliate and demean the people around them, their partner, um, sometimes their children, co-workers, etc. Also the borderline uh, personality. So when this is a disorder, it includes people who have unmanageable emotions. They call it emotion dysregulation. So they may be zero to a hundred, the situation gets zero or gets 100. Mm. Um, they can be super friendly one minute and a minute later they hate you, they're screaming at you, you know, I wish you would disappear or something like that. Um, they can have intense anger and they think uh, that a lot of um, perpetrators of domestic violence actually have borderline personality disorder and that's why they can't regulate their emotions and they lash out. And then they apologize later on, say, oh, I'm so sorry. And then they do it again later on. Mm -hmm. 
And so they don't have this emotion control and sometimes physical control. So that can be really difficult. And uh, the third one I'll mention is the antisocial personality disorder, or also known as sociopath. And about half of them are involved as criminals and end up in prison or arrested, et cetera. But the other half aren't. And many of them may go into business schemes. Um, they, they, they lie. They're very comfortable lying, conning people. I've, I've helped people get divorced from some of those. And like in one example, a woman had two kids, been married six years. And in the divorce process, she found out her husband actually didn't have a job. Every day he was leaving for work, it was a big con. And where he was getting his money from is he was actually siphoning it off of the wife's father's business. Oh, my God. And so just total con. People could be totally not who you think mm -hmm. they are. So when you talk about borderline, we, I always hear that in relation to bipolar. Can you just explain the difference between the two? Because there's a lot of similarities, right? Yeah. So the, the big similarity is they both involve mood swings. The big difference is bipolar is mood swings usually over a period of weeks and months. So someone may have a manic episode for a couple weeks, they're out meeting people, buying things, talking constantly, not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And then for a couple months, they might be depressed. You never hear from them. You wonder if they're still alive. Um, and they just don't have the energy to get up, to go out, et cetera. Now, that's a more, they think, more of a chemical um, disorder in the brain. And that's why it's mostly treated by medication. Borderline personality disorders, mood swings in a matter of minutes, and there isn't a medication when people get mm -hmm. good treatment for that. It's typically two to five years of wow. good group counseling, individual counseling, and they really like learning a completely new language for how to live life. And I, I think recovery from personality disorders is like learning a new language mm -hmm. and you can't get a pill for that and there's also support groups for uh relatives or spouses who are who have someone in their life that is that which i think is really important too because if you're a family member you have to and you're you're sticking it out with this person you have to learn how to cope too yes and that's so important is because when you're around someone this unpredictable and this angry, it's hard to not absorb some of that. But yeah. if you have support and you can tell yourself and tell each other, it's not about me, it's about her problem, mm. then you're, you don't absorb as much of that. And as I was a therapist before I was a lawyer, and I worked with a lot of people with borderline personality disorder, and I really learned it's not about me. So it got easier to not take it personal mm. and stay focused on what's the next thing I want to accomplish with this person rather than uh, how can I defend myself? Because that doesn't help. Which is interesting because you were the professional in that setting, the provider, and you were still sort of going through that with these people. So you imagine how hard it is for someone who's married to someone struggling with that. Yes, definitely. Because if I see them for an hour a week, I can generally manage that. But even so, I get hooked inside sometimes. Yeah. I remember one young woman with borderline personality. It wasn't a divorce case. Um, and she was just trying to get her life organized. And she'd get really angry. And she'd get angry at me. And I'd feel really helpless. And I remember one day I said, you know, I feel really helpless is that what you feel? And she said, that's exactly what I'm feeling right now. Mm. And so I caught her emotions. And rather than focusing on the anger, we focused on the helplessness because I said, I caught your helplessness. Mm. And that's just so difficult. Let's look at what you can do because you're not really helpless. There's things you can do. So it was a very productive discussion. It's so it's just so interesting to me this idea of energy and how 
you can share it with someone else or you meet someone and it immediately changes the energy in the room and there's like such a shift and it's it's fascinating yeah and i think having compassion for high conflict people is something i always want to emphasize because they didn't choose to be like this they might have been born this way early childhood was difficult or abusive the culture they grew up in reinforced this so we still have to deal with it but have some compassion all right bill you have a new book coming out because what is it 15 books wasn't enough you added another <laughs> <laughs> to your list can you talk a little bit about it yes so it's calming upset people with e-a-r here i'll hold it up <laughs> and e-a-r stands for empathy attention and respect and that's for ear statements. So it's a simple technique. I mentioned it early on that if you can say just a sentence that shows some empathy, mm -hmm. like I can see how frustrated you are, or like I just described with that client, that I, I can feel how helpless you're feeling. And so if you connect with what they're experiencing, then they calm down because they don't have to fight to get you to pay attention to how they're feeling. Or say, I'll pay attention, tell me more. Or say, I really respect your efforts or I respect your work. Even on the job, you can say, I respect how hard you worked on that project or that was a really helpful contribution. And so ear, any of those three or all of those three put together tend to calm people down, say 90% of the time. What do you say to the person who responds and says, okay, I hear you, Bill, like that's all great, but I don't want to give in to my ex and I don't want him or her to think that they have the win if I react that way. Yeah, it's not, you haven't given up anything to give an ear statement. You can still be firm on decisions. You can still be confident. Um, it's amazing. I, when I first developed this method about 15 years ago, I was kind of like, well, when does this work? When doesn't it work? Mm -hmm. And it surprised me how often it did work. So I think what's important to know is you're not giving up anything, but you're calming the other person. Then you can talk about problem solving. Then you can say, that's not okay with me. You can even set limits with an ear statement and say, I'm not willing to meet with you in person next week. Um, I understand that may feel frustrating to you, but I'm not willing to go that far at this time. Are there times, you said that there are some times where it doesn't work. Um, do you have any examples of that in situations where you've seen that this was just not effective? Um, some, some high conflict people really wanted to be angry. Mm. And I've had sometimes they can feel themselves calming and that makes them angry because they feel, it's like, I'm like, I'm, I'm like jello or so I'm not fighting with them and they wanted to fight. It's like yeah. tug of war, you know, there's a, a little mud puddle and you got the rope at both ends. If you let go of the rope, the other person may fall in the mud. So if I let go of the rope and don't fight, it's really hard for them to keep fighting. The other thing I want to mention, though, and that is safety. And there are cases like domestic violence where you're thinking, well, how can I calm him down before he hits me again? And I would say that the priority should be getting away, getting to a safe place. So if you can get out and get to a safe place, don't waste any time on a biff state, on, a, on an ear statement. On the other hand, if you can't get away, an ear statement may be something to really mm -hmm. help calm the situation. And I actually give an example of the, in the book where a woman was taken hostage at gunpoint and she used, I think, ear statements to calm the guy down and he eventually let her go. So it's, it's try it and it doesn't hurt to try. If it doesn't yeah. work, try it again. If that doesn't work, move on. Mm, interesting. So you're, you're suggesting like de-escalation. Yes, it's very much a de-escalation tactic. And I might mention we've also started teaching this to some police departments. Mm. Yeah, that's um, what triggered that for me. <laughs> because they're really, 
trying to put more emphasis on de-escalation than peaceful ways. And this is a peaceful way. The tone of voice, their body language makes a huge difference if people calm down or if it feeds, feeds a conflict. Do you think that there are circumstances where you have um, such a high conflict situation where co-parenting just isn't possible and maybe they resort to parallel parenting or someone having final decision making or some other arrangement? Yes, there are situations where that's the best and, and that's fine. I've, I've had cases like that, even 50-50 parallel parenting. Mm -hmm. I had this one, one case, I represented a husband and once a year we'd meet with a parenting coordinator who would map out the entire schedule for the year, holidays, activities, all of that. And for the rest of the year, they had very little communication yeah. and this is a case that had some really terrible allegations at the beginning the parents really virtually hated each other mm -hmm. and by after a year or so of working with this um, we calmed them down enough and to my knowledge they've done the parallel parenting since then Mm. And that, do you believe that that's best for kids? Are, are kids impacted? Do they know that parents aren't communicating with each other? It's, it's better than constant conflict and chaos. And that's what happens in some cases. So if, if you can communicate, keep things calm, use these skills with each other, and they work, that's really great. If nothing seems to work, then minimum contact, especially between the parent who, uh, they're at, let's say they're at dad's house, mom shouldn't be calling them at dad's yeah. house. And when they're at mom's house, dad shouldn't be calling. That's so stressful for kids in a high conflict case is right. to have the other parent kind of disrupting and mm -hmm. judging and, and all of that. So mm, yep. yeah, I think that can work. So these skills and tools are practical, but not all the time in every case yeah and w i mean we see that a lot too right one parent's constantly calling on the other parent's time and the and just the the conflict and how the kids feel like we hear like kids are stressed out so never a good situation yeah. so bill how do we connect with you where do we get all 58 of your books <laughs> <laughs> well actually you can find my all my books on amazon they've got an amazon page you could just put bill eddy books in there uh, but also our high conflict institute is our main source uh, it's high www.highconflictinstitute.com and we have books, we have videos, we have free articles, uh, we have consultation if they want to set up a consultation with me or one of our other uh, speakers. Um, we also have a 12-session uh, online parenting class. And if you're court ordered, uh, you can find that on our High Conflict Institute website. If you're not court ordered and you just want to take a good parenting class, we have another website called conflictplaybook.com and they can find the parenting class there and um, go ahead and take it. So, so a lot of resources. Yeah, uh, a ton. And I mean, really, it, it, one, two, five of your books should be required reading. And if anyone's listening and they are, they're dealing with a high conflict spouse, like pick up, um, which one would you recommend that they start with? Um, well, if they're in the middle of a high conflict divorce, I'd recommend splitting, which is protecting yourself while divorcing someone with borderline or narcissistic mm -hmm. personality disorder. And the second edition came out July 1st. And I encourage you to get the second edition because I talk about how to present your case to professionals. I talk more about antisocial personality disorder because we're seeing that in more high conflict cases. If you're already past the divorce or uh, just looking for how to communicate, I'd say the new book, Calming Upset People with EAR, and the book Biff for Co-Parent Communication. That's for the written communication, ear statements, or for the verbal communication over the phone, by Zoom, or in person. 
So that's what I'd suggest. Yeah. (laughs) There's so many resources, all great stuff. And I'll put all of the links in the notes. Bill, thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm a little smarter already just because of the half hour we spent together. But it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. And I'm so glad you're doing the work you're doing. So your audience is helped by all of this. Thank you. (laughs) 